Hey, Slasher! Look like you run that before. Good job, Slash. Whatever you needed, he could do it. He was a quarterback slash running back slash wide receiver slash punter. If there was a football definition of a Swiss army knife, that was Cordell Stewart. But it wasn't just that he was versatile. It was that he could affect the game at pretty much any skill position on the offensive end. He was ahead of his time as a dual threat quarterback, and although he had periods of his career where he got to play that way, he was more often being forced into a more traditional pocket passer role, which was the expectation of a QB back in the mid-90s. Stewart's time in the NFL was volatile, as one week he would be expected to be a quarterback, then the next week he could be benched, yet still see time at receiver, as no one really seemed to be sure how they wanted to use him. His best years came in Pittsburgh, yet they were up and down. He had some great years, and he had some not so great years. He dealt with adversity, but also took the Steelers to great heights. He was loved and hated at times, but even today is one of the most exciting players to ever step on an NFL field. But there's also the question around if Stewart had the accuracy and decision making to be a quarterback. But regardless of how up and down his career was, Stewart needs to be remembered for being one of the first guys to play completely out of the box and act as a pioneer for the dual threat quarterbacks that become so common today. Let's jog your memory. A Louisiana native, Cordell Stewart attended John Errett High School in Marrero. Stewart was the epitome of a dual threat QB during his high school career, as the Patriots would reach the playoffs each season he played. As a junior, he threw for 1,645 yards and 19 touchdowns. Then his senior season saw him throw for 942 yards and 17 touchdowns, while rushing for 923 yards and 23 touchdowns, as he would lead the Patriots to the district championship while taking home the New Orleans Player of the Year award. However, Stewart didn't begin as a quarterback, as he originally played as a corner on the defensive side of the ball, until his coach Billy North decided to move him to QB. After a great senior season which helped put him on the map, Stewart would accept a scholarship to play for Colorado and coach Billy McCartney partially due to Colorado's offense strongly emphasizing the option. The Buffaloes were coming off a great season and an Orange Bowl victory, so they had a good team in place, and Stewart would be deep on the QB depth chart, as he appeared in just two games and attempted two passes, but he would rush for 144 yards and a touchdown in those two games. Yet overall his role was minimal on a 91 Buffaloes team who went 8-3 and, and lost to Alabama in the Blockbuster Bowl, with Stewart's freshman season ending with him passing for two yards while rushing for 144 and a touchdown. With the graduation of Darian Hagan, the Buffaloes had a hole at QB, and Stewart would earn the starting spot. He clearly had the legs to create on his own, but he was still able to be effective through the air, thanks in part to a great receiver duo made up of Charles Johnson and Michael Westbrook. Stewart would silence a lot of early season doubters in a week one matchup versus rival Colorado State when he totaled a school record 409 yards through the air with four touchdowns in a blowout win. Then in week two versus Baylor, he would throw for three more touchdowns in another blowout, as Stewart was pretty much only a passer this year, totaling all of his positive yards through the air. Colorado was looking strong, as they would start the season 5-0 and rank as high as number eight, before finishing the year at 9-1-1 and getting a Fiesta Bowl matchup with Syracuse, which would unfortunately end in a four-point loss after kicker Mitch Berger missed a field goal and two extra points as Stewart finished the 92 season with 2,109 yards through the air, 12 touchdowns and 9 picks, while putting up negative 18 yards on 60 carries with one touchdown on the ground. The 93 season finally saw Stewart get more chances on the ground, as he would finish as the team's third leading rusher. Johnson and Westbrook were still his top targets, but Westbrook had a big decline in his production. Colorado began the year ranked number 11 and got as high as number 7 after a 2-0 start but would then lose two close games to ranked opponents like Stanford and Miami. They would still go 5-1-1 the rest of the year, including a big road win over Oklahoma, as he would finish at 8-3-1 and get a matchup versus Fresno State in the Aloha Bowl, who they would defeat, even though Stewart did not account for any scores in the game. And Stewart's junior season ended with him throwing for a career-high 2,299 yards with 11 touchdowns and 7 interceptions, while adding 524 yards and six more touchdowns on the ground. 1994 would be one of the best seasons in Colorado Buffalo's history, thanks in no small part to Stewart. The Buffaloes would be a top 10 scoring offense in the nation, as a duo of Stewart and Heisman winning running back Rashawn Salam were a dangerous rushing attack. 
as Salam would rush for over 2,000 yards, with Stewart rushing for a career-high 639 yards, which was second on the team. Colorado had rammed through their first two opponents of the year, as they were averaging over 51 points per game going into a Week 3 matchup with number 4 ranked Michigan in Ann Arbor. Colorado had fallen behind 26-14, and at one point had gone scoreless for 35 minutes. Both seconds left, they were down by just 5, and had the ball at their own 36, so they needed nothing short of a miracle. Stewart with time. Let's it go. He's got three people down there. The ball's up in the air. Caught. Stewart dropped back and launched the ball over 70 yards downfield into a sea of players, but a tipped ball found its way to receiver Michael Westbrook, who caught the walk-off touchdown on a play now known as the Miracle at Michigan. But this was more than just an exciting win as it catapulted Colorado into the top five national rankings. And after a close win versus Texas the next week, they would win three more games convincingly before a number two ranked Buffalo's team would take on number three ranked Nebraska, but a loss knocked them down to number seven. And even though they would win out the rest of the year, the 10 and one Buffaloes would finish as the fourth ranked team in the nation and miss out on a chance to play for the national championship instead playing an unranked Notre Dame team in the Fiesta Bowl, who they would defeat, as Stewart passed and rushed for a score, and his senior season ended with a second-team All-American selection, as he threw for 2,071 yards, 10 touchdowns, and 3 interceptions, while adding 639 yards and 7 more touchdowns on the ground. So Stewart had put together a more efficient senior season, only throwing 3 interceptions, after averaging 8 over the previous 2 years which he attributed to new assistant coach Rick Neuheisel, who he would say helped him learn coverages, which gave him more confidence. As Stewart would say, he would have been a first round pick in the 95 NFL draft if he had him his whole college career. But Stewart wasn't waiting too far past the first round. As is often the case with a dual threat quarterback, most teams wanted to switch him to a different position, but Stewart was set on playing QB which also likely contributed to him falling to a late second round pick. Similar to his arrival at Colorado, the Steelers were set at quarterback for the 95 season, yet starter Neil O'Donnell was set to be a free agent at the end of the year. The Steelers were establishing themselves as an AFC powerhouse, coming off of an AFC championship appearance under head coach Bill Cowher. The 95 version of the team featured a top five scoring offense and their great Blitzburg defense, led by linebackers Greg Lloyd, Chad Brown, LaVon Kirkland, and Kevin Green, with their best offensive weapon being receiver Yancey Thigpen. Stewart had a minimal role, not seeing his first action until week 8. As a thrower this year, he recorded just 7 total passes, yet his first career throw would be a touchdown versus the Browns in week 13. But he showed a new level of versatility, as after being such a great rusher in college, he was now even being used as a receiver, as on top of having 85 yards and a touchdown on the ground, he also caught 14 balls for 235 yards and a 71-yard touchdown versus Cincinnati, accomplishing the rare feat of throwing, rushing for, and catching a touchdown in the same season, as he would finish fourth in Offensive Rookie of the Year voting. And it was during this time that Steelers color coordinator Myron Cope gave Stewart his nickname of Slash, due to the multiple slashes between his listed positions. The 95 Steelers continued their success from the year before, as they finished at 11-5, and got a divisional round matchup versus Buffalo. Stewart would have one attempt on the ground and catch two passes, but he showed even more versatility this game, as he even had a 41-yard punt in a Steelers win. The AFC Championship brought the Colts, and Stewart would leave his mark on this game, as before the end of the first half, he caught a touchdown pass to put the Steelers up 10-6, and would also rush for 12 yards in another Steelers win, as they were heading to the Super Bowl to take on the Dallas Dynasty of the 90s. Stewart would get 4 attempts for 15 yards on the ground in a 27-17 loss, which has become more infamous for Neil O'Donnell's 2 interceptions thrown to Larry Brown. So Stewart's rookie season ended with him throwing for 60 yards and a touchdown, rushing for 85 and another touchdown, and finally receiving for 235 yards and another touchdown. So O'Donnell was gone going into the 96 season, but Stewart would still have to wait for his opportunity, as backup Mike Tomzak would take over as starter. But the Steelers had made a draft day trade with St. Louis for some much needed rushing, as they would acquire eventual franchise legend Jerome Bettis, who would finish as a top three rusher in the league this year. Third year wideout Charles Johnson, who had played with Stewart at Colorado, would have his best season due to Thigpen being limited to just six games with foot and hamstring injuries. 
Stewart would appear in all 16 games this year, and although he would get 30 pass attempts, he completed just 11 of them for 100 yards and 2 picks. But he would rush for 171 yards with 5 touchdowns, including a league best 80 yard run in week 17 versus Carolina. Additionally, he would put up career highs in receiving, with 17 catches for 293 yards and 3 touchdowns. The Steelers again had a good year with a great defense, even though they had let Green walk in the offseason and Lloyd was limited to one game after tearing his patella tendon. They would finish at 10 and 6 and defeat Indianapolis in the wild card as Stewart rushed for 48 yards and two touchdowns. Unfortunately, New England would handle Pittsburgh in the divisional as Stewart had 19 yards on the ground in a loss and his second season would end with him putting up 100 yards passing, 171 yards rushing, and 293 yards receiving with eight total touchdowns. But going into the 97 season, Stewart was finally going to get the chance that he needed. Over the summer, Stewart was signed to a two-year extension and was named the starter going into the 97 season, and he would turn in one of the greatest seasons of his career. His 3,020 yards through the air would be a top 15 mark in the league, and his 476 yards on the ground would be second among QBs, as he would also have a career-high 11 scores on the ground. Additionally, he would pass for 21 touchdowns, but struggled with decision-making, as he had 17 interceptions but he would still become the first player in history to throw for at least 20 touchdowns and rush for at least 10 more in a season. He wouldn't put up any receiving numbers this year, but as a starting quarterback, you didn't want any extra injury risk. Luckily for him, he again had a top 3 rusher in Bettis, and a healthy year from Thigpen would see him finish as a top 3 receiver. Stewart would record rushing touchdowns in 8 games, including 3 multi-score games, and then would have 7 games with at least 200 passing yards, and seven games with multiple touchdowns through the air. But arguably his best career game would come late in the season on December 7th, when the 11-3 Broncos came to Pittsburgh to take on the 10-4 Steelers. Stewart would throw a first quarter touchdown to Thigpen, and then hit him for two more touchdowns in the second quarter. In the second half, he would do his damage on the ground, as he rushed for a touchdown in both the third and fourth quarter. The game ended with the Steelers' comeback win, and Stewart had accounted for 303 passing yards, 49 rushing yards, and 5 total touchdowns. Pittsburgh would end the year at 11-5 and get some revenge on New England, as they beat them 7-6 in the divisional round. And although Stewart threw for only 134 yards, he also rushed for the game-winning touchdown. However, the conference championship would see Denver get their revenge, as Stewart would throw 3 interceptions and lose a fumble in a 3-point loss. But Stewart's first season as a starting QB ended with him throwing for 3,020 yards, 21 touchdowns, and 17 picks, while rushing for 476 yards and 11 touchdowns. The 98 season would be a struggle for Stewart and the whole Steelers offense. To start, offensive coordinator Chan Gailey had taken a job with Dallas, meaning Stewart had to get used to a new coordinator in Ray Sherman, and Pittsburgh would drop to a bottom three scoring offense this year. The Steelers had a promising rookie in receiver Heinz Ward, but Thigpen had left in free agency, and Ward wouldn't have a huge impact just yet. On top of that, the Steelers' O-line was banged up all year, not only affecting Stewart's time in the pocket, but also their rushing game as a whole. Stewart would once again be a top two rusher on the team, and their starting quarterback, but his turnovers were a huge problem, as he threw for only 11 touchdowns while throwing 18 interceptions, and he would rush for only two touchdowns after 11 last year. This season would see Stewart throw for multiple touchdowns just twice, but the Steelers were still staying afloat as they were 7-4 with 5 games left, but they would collapse, going 0-5 in those games, with Stewart failing to throw a touchdown pass in the final 4 games of the season, as Pittsburgh finished at 7-9 and, and missed the playoffs, and Stewart's year saw him throw for 2,560 yards, 11 touchdowns, and 18 picks, while rushing for 406 yards and 2 touchdowns. So after his great 97 season, Stewart wasn't just a gadget player anymore. He was a leader and the quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But with that increased role and popularity, came a lot more attention in 98, both good and bad. The good would come before the season in March of 98, when Stewart joined Kobe Bryant, Eric Lindros, and Alex Rodriguez on the first official cover of ESPN The Magazine. But the bad came a few months later, as Stewart would recall in a much later interview, the scrutiny he faced due to rumors coming out about his sexuality, as he would explain a November phone call, letting him know that people were saying he had been arrested in a park after being caught engaging in indecent acts with a man. 
And nowadays, Stewart says he is someone who has love and appreciation for everyone. But he further explains that at that time, being a young black quarterback in a blue collar town was difficult enough. And that rumors like this were essentially a death sentence. But once the team heard the rumor, Stewart would say that even though he addressed them, he felt it was a big mistake and that the whole atmosphere changed and he was looked at differently. And now even fans were turning against him as in a week 14 loss to New England, he walked off the field to a beer poured on him and racial slurs being hurled his way. Eventually it was determined that the rumors were started by a cop, but the sources that provided owner Dan Rooney with his information would not reveal the name. Yet the damage was done and Stewart would say he fell into isolation and would stay in the darkness for the next couple of years. So once understanding everything that happened, the Steelers 0-5 finish to the 98 season makes a lot more sense, as the rumors came out right around the beginning of the losing streak. But Stewart would say that no matter what was thrown at him, he would never quit, and he would even draw on his mother's strength, who he had lost at 11 years old after a valiant battle with cancer, as he would say that throughout it all, his mother never lost her smile, and in comparing his situation to hers, he had nothing to complain about and would instead learn how to again enjoy the game like he once did when he was a little kid on the playground, as he still had a job to do going into 1999. After just one year and 21 touchdowns, Sherman stepped down as coordinator and was replaced with Kevin Gilbride. Their offense would see some improvement, but their defense saw a bit of decline, which led to another disappointing season. Pittsburgh looked great to begin the year, scoring a combined 66 points and going 2-0, with Stewart throwing for a touchdown and rushing for two more while committing zero turnovers. But after that, the offense sputtered, as over the next 10 weeks, they cracked 20 points just three times. And Stewart struggled, as he threw for five touchdowns and eight interceptions before losing his starting spot after the third loss of a six-game losing streak. Interestingly, once he was benched, he would again be used as a receiver to help fill in for an injured Courtney Hawkins. As in the final five games of the year, he would have 9 catches for 113 yards and a touchdown. Similar to last year, Pittsburgh had started decently as they were 5-3 after 8 games, but they would lose 7 of their final 8 to finish at 6-10 and, and again miss the playoffs. As Stewart threw for 1,464 yards, 6 touchdowns and 10 picks, while rushing for 258 yards and 2 more touchdowns. To begin the 2000 season, Stewart was a backup and veteran Kent Graham was starting. But Graham was barely producing for an 0-3 Steelers team, and after he injured his hip, Stewart would get the starting nod the next two weeks, yet would throw for just 272 yards and two touchdowns in those games. However, his rushing was great, as he went for 94 yards on 15 attempts, and Pittsburgh won both games. But Graham came back in Week 7, as the Steelers won again, but he would then be benched in favor of Stewart in Week 8, as Stewart would remain the starter the rest of the year. He would put up some great rushing numbers, finishing top 5 among QBs on the ground, but he wasn't doing a lot through the air, recording just one game with at least 200 passing yards. However, he would have a great stretch in weeks 12 through 14, when he threw for 6 touchdowns and 2 picks, while adding 4 more touchdowns on the ground. Pittsburgh would go 7-4 with Stewart as a starter, overall finishing at 9-7, but it wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth, as Stewart ended the year with 1,860 passing yards, 11 touchdowns, and 8 interceptions along with 436 rushing yards and 7 touchdowns. So there was concern around Stewart after a few questionable seasons, but 2001 would be a year of redemption. The 0-1 Steelers featured one of the league's best defenses, but they also featured the fifth offensive coordinator of Stewart's seven-year career. Yet this time, it was one who actually wanted to combine Stewart's unique athletic abilities with the quarterback position, instead of just trying to utilize his explosiveness in other facets of the offense. As now coordinator Mike Malarkey would explain that he shifted the focus from trying to make Stewart a dropback passer and instead let him roll out and make split decisions whether to pass or run. And it paid off. 2001 would be the final thousand yard season of Bettis' career and the first of Ward's career. So Stewart still had some reliable weapons. And this was all a recipe for a career year from a 29 year old Stewart. He was his usual threat on the ground, but his career high 537 yards would be tops among QBs as he would add 5 rushing touchdowns, yet would cough up a career-high 11 fumbles. And through the air, he went for a career-high 3,109 yards. It was a rough start for Stewart, as after 5 games he had thrown for 1 touchdown and 5 picks, while failing to crack 200 yards once. But Pittsburgh's great defense had carried them to a 4-1 record, 
but then things started clicking for Stewart. Over the next five weeks, he threw for at least 230 yards in four games, with five touchdowns through the air and three on the ground, while committing zero turnovers. As the Steelers improved to 8-2 and, and had won three straight, a streak which would extend to seven games, Stewart would have some of his most productive games near the end of the year, as he had his only 300-yard game of the year in a Week 14 win versus Baltimore, when he had 333 passing yards, two touchdowns, and no picks. Then the following week in a win versus Detroit, he would pass for three touchdowns and add one more on the ground with no turnovers. He would get a little sloppy to end the year, as he threw for four interceptions in a Week 16 loss to the Bengals, then had two picks, two fumbles, and no touchdowns in a Week 17 defeat of Cleveland. But overall, his redemption year was recognized, as he was voted to his first and only Pro Bowl, while finishing fourth in MVP voting and tying for second in Comeback Player of the Year voting. And Pittsburgh was again an AFC force, finishing at 13-3. The divisional round would see them defeat Baltimore, as Stewart had a modest showing with 184 total yards, one touchdown, and one interception. But they would again come up short in the AFC Championship, taking on a Patriots team led by a second-year Tom Brady. The Steelers would lose, but only by a single score, which brought further scrutiny onto Stewart, as although he produced nearly 300 total yards, he would have zero touchdowns, throw three interceptions, and commit two fumbles, losing one of them. But it wasn't all on Stewart, as Pittsburgh allowed two touchdowns on special teams, with one of them resulting in a possible 10-point swing, after New England returned a blocked field goal for a touchdown. But for his regular season, Stewart had thrown for 3,109 yards, 14 touchdowns, and 11 picks, while adding 537 yards and five more touchdowns on the ground. But little did Stewart know, he had just reached the peak of his NFL career. After such a great year, Stewart was the starter going into 0-2, but he was throwing a lot to begin the season, as in the first two games he had a combined 71 pass attempts, and had thrown for 443 yards along with three touchdowns and four picks, as the Steelers were 0-2. But after 25 more pass attempts in a Week 3 game versus Cleveland, he would throw an end zone interception and be replaced by backup Tommy Maddox, who would lead the Steelers to the game-tying touchdown in the fourth quarter in a game they would eventually win in overtime. Over the next six games, Stewart would barely see the field, registering one pass attempt and one rush attempt. An injury to Maddox would force Stewart back into the starting role in weeks 11 through 13, and even though he could have been dejected about his benching, that wasn't who he was, and he would play admirably, throwing for 562 yards, three touchdowns and one interception, while adding 131 yards on the ground, and a throwback play versus Jacksonville when his 28-yard scamper to the end zone would be the Steelers' only touchdown of the day in a 25-23 victory, as overall Stewart went 2-1 during the stretch, helping to keep the Steelers' playoff hopes alive, as they were 7-4-1 when Maddox came back and finished at 10-5-1, which would get them in the playoffs, where they would defeat Cleveland in the wildcard before losing to Tennessee in the divisional, with Stewart never seeing the field during that stretch as overall his season saw him throw for 1155 yards, 6 touchdowns and 6 interceptions, while rushing for 191 yards and 2 more touchdowns. But his great run versus Jacksonville would be the final memorable moment of Cordell Stewart in a Steelers jersey. After the season, Pittsburgh decided to move on from Stewart, releasing him in late February, but he wasn't a free agent for long as he would sign with the Bears in mid-March, as they had also cut their starting QB Jim Miller. The Bears didn't have a ton on the offensive end, but would get a solid season out of third-year back Anthony Thomas and had Marty Booker, who made the Pro Bowl the year before, but he wouldn't have the same success this year, yet that may have been because he had three different QBs throwing him the ball. Stewart was a starter once again to begin the 0-3 season, but he underwhelmed. After five games, he had thrown for 745 yards, four touchdowns, and seven picks, but he did add 211 yards and a touchdown on the ground. But with the Bears sitting at 1-4, he was benched in favor of Chris Chandler, and the Bears had no intention of trying to use him as anything other than a QB, so Stewart wouldn't see the field over the next five games, as Chicago fell to 3-7. A Week 12 injury to Chandler would see Stewart act as his replacement, and then as a starter the following week, he would have his best game of the year, with 284 passing yards and two touchdowns, along with 26 rushing yards and another touchdown in a win. He would get one more chance in Week 14 versus Green Bay, but he went 17 for 40 through the air with 256 yards, one touchdown, and three picks in a loss. As after this, he would be replaced by rookie Rex Grossman and would only see brief action in a blowout loss to KC in the final game of the year, ending a 7-9 season from Chicago. 
as Stewart's year would see him lead the team with 1,418 passing yards, 7 touchdowns, and 12 interceptions, while finishing second on the team in rushing, with 290 yards and 3 touchdowns. But the Bears would give up on Stewart quickly and release him at season's end. The longtime Steeler would join the enemy in 2004, signing with the Baltimore Ravens. Baltimore had lost backup Anthony Wright for the season, so they would pick up Stewart to play second string to Kyle Bowler in what would be an interesting statistical season for Stewart. He wouldn't record a single pass attempt and would have only one rush attempt for negative one yards, but a week 10 injury to punter Dave Zastudel forced Stewart in as emergency relief, as he would punt five times for a total of 177 yards, with two landing inside the 20 during a three-point win versus the Jets which would even earn him a Special Teams Player of the Week award. But overall, he had an almost non-existent role on a Ravens team who finished at 9-7 and, and missed the playoffs, as Stewart's season saw him record no passing yards and negative one rushing yards. The 05 season would be much of the same for Stewart, as he had originally been released by the Ravens, but after a Week 1 injury to Bowler, he would be signed as Anthony Wright's backup. However, his only appearance would come in a Week 9 loss to the Bengals, when he ran the ball four times for 24 yards. But a couple days after this game, Baltimore would release him, as Stewart finished with no pass attempts or pass yards, and 24 rushing yards, as 2005 marked his final season on an active roster until he officially retired as a Steeler in 2012. The career of Cordell Stewart is an interesting one. Without a doubt, he was ahead of his time, and it hasn't been until recently that mobile quarterbacks have been coveted for their dual threat ability, as during the time Stewart played, the quarterback position was still thought of quite rigidly and by the time he got to the NFL, he was forced more so into a pocket passer role, which didn't fit his skill set. There were times when his versatility was maximized, and it produced exciting results. But on the other hand, Stewart was set on playing quarterback, yet might not have had the necessary accuracy and decision making to excel at the position. It's easy to say that he could have had the best career if he was used as a Swiss Army Knife type player, but that was also out of his control, as once you make a guy your starting QB in the 90s, you wanted him to play like a traditional QB, and that's just not what Cordell Stewart was. But that's what made him so intriguing. He could play every skill position on the offensive side of the ball and play it well. And in today's game, he probably would have been even more of a game breaker than he was back then. And even though his stats look underwhelming, Cordell Stewart more than anything was a glimpse into the future of everything the QB position could become. He was just a couple decades early. But that's it for today's episode on Slash. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on another QB who could hurt you with his arms or legs. Or this one on another forgotten player of the 90s. Thanks for watching and see you next time.